Well, good morning, brethren. I want to talk today about uh, the three resurrections as we know it, scripturally speaking. The doctrine of the resurrection of the dead is fundamental to our understanding of Jesus Christ and his plan for every human being since the beginning of mankind. This doctrine is one of the elementary principles of Christ listed in Hebrews 6, 1 through 2. Well, let's read that. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God of the doctrine of baptisms, of laying on of hands, of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. This teaching is fundamental and one of the first things that a Christian should be taught. Eternal life through the resurrection of the hope is the hope of all mankind. Titus 1 verse 2 Yet there is an order which all of the dead will be resurrected. And we'll see that in a few minutes. The Apostle Paul states in 1 Corinthians 15, 22 through 24, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ the first fruits. Afterward, those who are Christ at his coming. Then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father. When he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. Because you know Christ is going to return. You can find that in Revelation chapter 19. On trumpets, on the Holy Day trumpets. Now, let's speak about Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the only one who has been resurrected from the dead to eternal life. As the following scripture will tell us, you can turn your Bibles if you want to, to Acts 26, 22. No one else has been resurrected to everlasting life. Not Moses, not Abraham. David, Elijah, Paul, or anyone else. They're all still in their graves awaiting the resurrection. The first fruits resurrection. Acts 26, 22 says, Therefore, having obtained help from God, to this day I stand witnessing both to small and great say no other things than those which the prophets and Moses said would come, that the Christ would suffer, that he would be the first to rise from the dead, and would proclaim light to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. And in Colossians 1.18, you don't have to turn there, you can write that down. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, and all things. He may have the preeminence. Revelation 1 and 5. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us, from our sins and his own blood. But how can Jesus be the first to rise from the dead? What about those in the Old Testament that God resurrected during the time of Elijah and Elijah? In 1 Kings 17, talks about that. 17 through 23, and 2 Kings chapter 4, 32 through 37, and 13 and 21. How about those in the New Testament that Christ resurrected during his ministry in Luke and John? 
All of these individuals, as the following scriptures show, were only resurrected to a completion of their physical lives. Their lives were only extended a number of years. And since they were mortal, they eventually died. Well, Hezekiah was given 15 extra years. Let's see, John 3, 13. No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is, the Son of Man who is in heaven. And 1 Corinthians 15, 20. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. <clears throat> of course, fallen asleep means who have passed away or died. 1 Corinthians 15, 22 through 22, 23, I'm sorry. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all should be made alive, but each one in his own order. Christ the first fruits, afterward those who are Christ at his coming. And Hebrews eleven thirty nine, if you want to turn there, says, all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. That is the promise of eternal life. God having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. In other words, you're not made perfect until you're resurrected into the kingdom of God. Well, they have been resurrected, so therefore... They have not been made perfect apart from us. They will be made perfect in our resurrection with us at the same time. Remember, each in their own order. Therefore, Jesus Christ is the first to rise from the dead as an immortal spirit being. No one else has been resurrected to eternal life. Acts chapter 2 talks about David, King David still being in the grave. He hasn't been raised to eternal life. We talked about it a few minutes ago. Regarding the term first fruits that refers to Christ's resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 23, the Greek word is a parche and is defined as primarily an offering of first fruits and it's to make a beginning in sacrifices to offer first fruits. A first fruit indicates that which is first in order or first in importance. For Christ, both applications apply. The resurrection of Jesus Christ makes it possible for others to be included in the first fruit harvest at his coming. That's at a future trumpets. 1 Corinthians 15, 22. The resurrection of human beings that are part of the first fruit harvest is called, in Revelation 26, the first resurrection. The expression, First resurrection proves that there has to be at least one more resurrection. You can't say first if it is the only one. <clears throat> one would then only say the resurrection. The first resurrection would be comprised, brethren, of those who have died in the faith and those who are physically alive in the faith at Christ's return. There are several descriptive passages of this resurrection. The first one is 1 Corinthians 15, 23. But each one in his own order, Christ the first fruit, afterwards those who are Christ at his coming. And then you have Philippians 3, 8 through 11. You can write these down as we go along to study later or read. Yet indeed, I also count all things lost by the excellence of the knowledge of Christ, Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them 
as rubbish. That I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, which is from the law, which is the, under the old covenant. But that which is through faith in Christ, your righteousness is from God by faith. There are two righteousnesses. We won't get into that right now. But you have the righteousness of the old covenant, and then you have the righteousness of the new covenant. That's what that's talking about. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. And then there's Philippians 3, 20 through uh, 21. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may conform to his glorious body according to the work by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. And then Hebrews 11, 32 through 35. And what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah also of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lying, talking about Samson, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, David, Solomon. Turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Of course, there were others. Women received their dead raised to life. Again, others were tortured, not accepting deliverance. In other words, they were martyred. That they might obtain a better resurrection. They were martyred for their testimony in Christ. They uh, believed in God's way, obeyed his commandments. They were murdered. Uh, that goes also under the parable of counting the cost. But we won't get into that right now. And then as Revelation 24 through 6. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received the mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. <clears throat> Excuse me. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such, the second resurrection has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Revelation 24 through 6 is a key passage from which several questions may arise due to the writing style of John. Some of these questions will be addressed in the following paragraphs. While the saints rule for only a thousand years, though a thousand years is only mentioned here, this passage should be understood in light of all the scriptures concerning the reign of the saints. <clears throat> these following statements that I make is going to show those in the first resurrection will reign with Christ forever. And you can find that in Daniel 12, 3, Revelation 22, 5, and other scriptures. Therefore, the reference to a thousand years 
does not limit the reign of the saints to that period. A thousand years are part of a greater whole eternity, a greater picture overall. So the question some people may ask, who are the saints that will be seated on the thrones in Revelation 24? They sat on the throne. The judgment was committed to them. Who were they? <clears throat> the identity of they and them is not easily detected in the grammar. But there are three options to be considered. Number one, are these saints exclusively those martyred in the end time of the beast power? Those who had been beheaded? Grammatically speaking, the martyrs could be the subject of they and them. The verse begins with, and I saw those seated on thrones. The next statement says, then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded. This second, I saw, is not in the Greek as noted in some translations. The omission of this phrase could better identify these martyrs with those seated on thrones in the beginning of the verse. Uh, notice the interlinear. Greek concordance of the New Testament. And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them, and the souls of the ones having been beheaded because of the witness of Jesus and because of the word of God, and who did not worship the beast. Additionally, the expression and the souls of the ones having been beheaded could be rendered differently. The Greek word kai is translated differently and even indeed then but also etc. According to the context in which it is used. Therefore, a possible reading of this verse is, I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them, even the souls of the ones having been beheaded. Does another group of saints join the martyrs upon the thrones of Revelation 24? The grammar can allow for an, for an additional group of first fruits. And who? K.I. Hointinus did not worship the beast, according to the interlinear Greek concordance. The Greek Hointinus, I hope I said that right, H O I T I N E S, is the plural for hostess, meaning everyone who, whoever, everyone, who, anyone, who, etc. So a possible rendering is even the soul of them that were beheaded and everyone who did not worship the beast. This clause, K-I, is, is discussed in the expansion Try that again. Expositor's Bible commentary. It could simply introduce a further dis a qualifying phrase to the identification of the martyrs, but it may also be understood to introduce a second group. So this immediately alleviates a thorny problem. Why only the martyrs should live and reign with Christ. Expositors also notes that this could be a second group of martyrs. But nevertheless, the grammar could include a second group of first fruits 
who had not been martyred, seated upon the thrones. Lastly, does Revelation 20, 14, I mean 24, include all the saints who ever lived? Well, this conclusion is accordingly, is according to the harmony of all the related scriptures, not just the grammar in these verses. Consequently, this would remove the thorny problem of excluding, of excluding most of the first fruits from the thrones in Revelation 24. The first two options considered fit the symbolic theme of John's vision without necessarily excluding the rest of the saints in the first resurrection. The scriptures lead to the conclusion that all the saints in the first resurrection will be seated on the thrones of Revelation 24. All saints will be resurrected together and will rule during the millennium regardless of whether they were martyred by the beast or not. The saints in Revelation 24 should be identified in light <clears throat> excuse me, of all the scriptures pertaining to this resurrection. Another scripture mentions the saints will judge the world and shall judge angels. 1 Corinthians 6, 1 through 3. Therefore, the primary focus of judgment in the millennium with and under God will be upon the saints, not the angels. Now let's consider the chronology of events in the next verse. Revelation 25 says, the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. This verse can be misinterpreted because the thousand years are mentioned before the first resurrection. As if the millennium occurs before the first resurrection. However, other translations such as the New Revised Standard Version and the New International Version enclose the first sentence in parentheses. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Now consequently, brethren, the parenthetical statement would not be part of the strict chronology of this verse understanding John's writing style can help clear up the chronology here. The New Living Translation places the parenthetical statement at the end of the verse. This is the first resurrection. The rest of the dead did not come back to life until the thousand years had ended. This type of rendering better reflects the chronology from all the scriptures concerning the first resurrection and the millennium. As with verse 4 discussed earlier, verse 5 should not be interpreted independently of the rest of the Bible, which reveals that the first resurrection will actually occur before the thousand-year period. Verse 6 says that those in the first resurrection shall reign with him a thousand years, meaning that they will be resurrected from the thousand year period. Additional scriptures concerning the first resurrection are as follows. Matthew 19, 28. Matthew 24, 31. You can write these down and read them. Luke 20, 34 through 36. Revelation 2, 11. He who has an ear, let him hear what the script, what the Spirit says to the churches. That's plural. Revelation 2 through 4 talks about seven churches through time. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. 
Revelation 2, 26 through 27, and Revelation 5, 10. The sons of the first resurrection will be like angels. They will not marry and they will not die anymore. When the thousand years are finished, the rest of the dead will be resurrected. And they will have the potential of either inheriting eternal life or dying a, or dying a second death. So the summary of the characteristics of the first resurrection are one. It takes place at the second coming of Christ, at the sound of the seventh trumpet, as I mentioned in the beginning. It is a resurrection to immortality. Physical bodies will be changed to spirit. That's called uh, being born again or being born anew. Only the dead in Christ and those in Christ who are alive at his coming are in <coughs> excuse me, the first resurrection. The second death has no power over those in the first resurrection. Those in this resurrection are called the first fruits. Now you can find that in Romans 8, 23, James 1 through 18, Revelation 14 and verse 4. Now let's, let's uh, elaborate and talk about the second resurrection. What about those who never had the opportunity to hear the truth? They clearly are not part of the first resurrection since they are not in Christ. You'll find that in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 17. The truth states, or when I say truth, I mean the word of God, the Bible, <clears throat> with the proper interpretation of the scriptures. That's very important. I suggest when you study the Old Testament and the New Testament, that you get an Old Testament Hebrew concordance because it was written in Hebrew and you get a New Testament Greek concordance. I suggest the interlinear uh, for the New Testament because the New Testament was written in Greek to help you with the interpretation and the romancing of words and their meanings, etc. Now, the Bible states, nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Acts 4.12 But are those who have never heard of Jesus then lost all of eternity? A lot of people have those questions. Millions of people have had those questions in the past. The following scriptures explain many will be resurrected to a physical life after the thousand year is over. After the thousand year period is over and receive an opportunity to not only hear of Christ but to understand his message because God is going to give them of his spirit. Revelation 27 through 12. Now when the thousand years have expired Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, which is the geographical area of the earth, to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. They went up on the breath of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. And books were open. And another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. Revelation 20.12 says that the book of life is open. 
not the book of death. What is written in the book of life? Well, other scriptures help fill in the answer. Luke 10, 20. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Philippians 4, 3. And I urge you also, true companion, help these women who labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. <clears throat> Brethren, those names are written in the book of life of those who have will receive eternal life at the resurrection. Revelation 3, 5. He who will come shall be clothed in white garments, which represents, symbolizes, clothed in righteousness, eternal life. <clears throat> because God imputes Christ's righteousness to each one. And I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Revelation 3, 13, 8. All who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb from the foundations of the world. Revelation 21, 27. But there should be no means, by no means enter anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. <clears throat> the Apostle Paul addressed the question of those who lived and died, but never had a chance to learn the truth of God, repent, and receive the Holy Spirit, have an opportunity for salvation. Now the verses I quote below, Paul explains that physical Israel was blinded spiritually and never had an opportunity to receive salvation. Romans chapter 11, 1 through 2, 5, 7, 11, 25 through 26, 30 through 31. I say then, has God cast away his people? Certainly not. God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew. Even so then, at this present time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace, God's mercy, kindness. What then? Israel has not obtained what it seeks, but the elect have obtained it, and the rest were blinded. I say then, have they stumbled that they would, should fall? Certainly not. For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion. That blindness in part has happened to Israel, from under the old covenant. Until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And all and so all Israel, except for a few whom God gave his spirit and called. I mean, so all Israel will be saved. For as you were once disobedient to God, yet have now obtained mercy through their obedience. Even so, these also have now been disobedient. How through the mercy shown you, they also may obtain mercy. Now, brethren, we should understand that while bread, but Paul's focus is on Israel, the same principles apply to all of mankind, as God is no respecter of persons. Acts 10.34 Paul then repeats his question in different words. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? Certainly not. Romans 11, 11. Paul then concludes by stating, and so all Israel will be saved. Romans eleven twenty six. Truly God has revealed a wonderful plan, a chance, plan, <clears throat> I'm sorry, well, he will have mercy on all, including those who have lived at one time, but never had 
an opportunity for salvation. Romans 11, 28 through 36. Those resurrected after the millennium will then have a chance for their names to be written in the book of life that is open to them at that time, representing eternal life. But will this be a second chance? No, it isn't. This will be their first opportunity to learn who God is and what this message was all about, what his message is all about. They will be drawn to Christ for the first time The giving of the Holy Spirit only occurs once. John 6, says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him or her. It should be clearly understood that this is not a second opportunity for salvation. While those in this resurrection will have a second mortal life. It will be their first opportunity for salvation. The second resurrection is reserved for those who never knowingly rejected God's offer to receive the Holy Spirit and endure to the end. Unlike the first resurrection, the second resurrection will be to a physical existence. Therefore, these will have an opportunity to inherit eternal life during the period following the millennium. Since flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. 1 Corinthians 15, 50. This resurrection will result in their first, their first opportunity to become inheritors of the kingdom of God. A vivid description in Old Testament scripture of the second resurrection to a physical existence is found in Ezekiel chapter 37. And it's regarding the Old Testament Israelites. Ezekiel 37, 5 through 6, 9 through 14. God says, Surely I will cause breath to enter into you. Now Ezekiel was, was shown a vision in the valley of dead bones. There was many, 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 many. So God showed Ezekiel a vision of what will happen to those dead people. The bones are so old, they're, you know, they're dust. They're, they're real dry. They've been there for probably hundreds of thousands of years. <clears throat> God says, Surely I will cause bread to enter into you, and you shall live. I will put sinews on you and bring flesh upon you, cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live. And breathe on these slain, that they may live. And breath came into them, and they lived, and stood upon their feet an exceedingly great army, like I just mentioned two minutes ago. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel then you shall know that I am the Lord. When I have opened your graves, O oh my people, and brought you up from your graves, I will put my spirit in you, and you shall live. The whole house of Israel, verse 11, will be resurrected to a physical existence because God never offered them an opportunity to receive his spirit within their minds and hearts toward eternal salvation. God is fair. He has no respect of persons. He doesn't want to live anybody else. As the following scriptures show, 
God's dwelling was within their midst, but not within their minds. In Deuteronomy 5.29, we find, Oh, that they had such a heart in them that they would fear me and always keep my commandments, that it might be well with them and with their children forever. Deuteronomy 29.4 says, Yet the Lord has not given you a heart to perceive and eyes to see and ears, ears to hear to this very day. So they were blinded, for they did not have the Spirit of God. <clears throat> Ezekiel 36, 26. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Now that heart of stone is in reference to stubbornness, stiff-necked people. Want to do it their way instead of God's way. Want to re, 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 resort to their righteousness, what they think is good, and not in accordance with the righteousness of God. This prophecy has not yet been fulfilled. God did not place his spirit within Old Testament Israel, except for the few prophets and righteous men and women identified in the Bible. I mentioned that earlier in the beginning. When this prophecy is fulfilled, God will give all people a new heart and a new spirit, which will enable them to keep his commandments. Now, that doesn't mean they will become perfect in that physical life. It just means they'll have to learn to grow and overcome because they're going to have trials and afflictions. You can read about that in Matthew 24. <clears throat> this will be the first time they will be given an opportunity to receive God's spirit. And if these physical humans, beings, remain loyal to God during this judgment period, they will not experience the second death from which there is no resurrection. These verses refute the erroneous assumption that God is trying to save the whole world before Jesus returns. The Gentiles who were... Who, the Gentiles who never received God's spirit will also be resurrected to a physical existence again, brethren. This will be a period of judgment when their ultimate fate will depend upon their responses to the calling of God. In this regard, understanding the Greek words for judgment can be helpful when studying the different resurrections. Crisis. K-R-I-S-I-S, -I -S, used in John 5, 29. And remember, brethren, what I said earlier. I recommend using the interlinear, the interlinear Greek concordance uh, used in John 5, 25. refers to the process of investigation and binds expository and Thomas Nelson's publishers, I mean, finds uh, expository dictionary of biblical words, <clears throat> refers to it in the same way. Croesus is often held in contrast to crema, which refers to the sentence pronounced, a verdict, a condemnation, the decision resulting from an investigation. A resurrection to judgment K-R-I-S-I-S is not necessarily a resurrection to condemnation. <clears throat> Most of mankind will be resurrected to a future time period of judgment or process of investigation. This process can lead to eternal life or to condemnation. In John 5, 29, Judgment is a better rendering of the crisis, as noted in other translations. Hebrews 9, 27 states, It is appointed for man to die once, but after this the judgment. So all of mankind will experience a judgment of some kind, but this doesn't mean condemnation for everyone. 
Being unjust before the return of Christ doesn't necessarily mean that one will die in the lake of fire. Billions of people who have done evil but were never called by God will be resurrected to a process of investigation or judgment. This is the judgment that is referred to. I'm going to give a few examples, brethren. Matthew 10, 15. Assuredly, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah <clears throat> excuse me, and the land of judgment. That's the word there is Croesus, than for that city. Few, if any, cities have done more evil than Sodom and Gomorrah. Jesus was not saying that certain portions of the lake of fire are more tolerable than others. Nevertheless, brethren, it will be more tolerable for them in the day of judgment because during this period of time, many will repent and we will marvel that others did not previously listen to Christ in the flesh. Matthew 12, 41 through 42. The men of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment, Christus, with this generation and condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And indeed, a greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And indeed, a greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh and the queen of Sheba will be resurrected or will rise up. At the same time as the Jews who lived during the time of Christ with this generation, these Gentiles will speak against those who rejected Christ while he was in the flesh. Obviously, if all in the second resurrection were immediately condemned to the lake of fire, then these contrasts would be meaningless as it would not be more tolerable for anyone. God's Spirit will be offered to those in the second resurrection. Uh, an Old Testament scripture reference it can be Ezekiel 36, 26 through 28, if you want to write that down. When Christ returns, God will offer his spirit to all flesh. During the millennium, Joel 2, 28, and Acts 2, 17, and he will continue to offer his spirit during the time period of the second resurrection to those who were never given eyes to see or ears to hear, as I mentioned earlier. Old Testament Israel, Sodom and Gomorrah, and billions of others who didn't have the Spirit of God, but who were blinded. How long will this second resurrection last? Well, there is one possible mention of it, um, mention of its duration in Isaiah 65, 17, through 25. It says, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered or come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. <clears throat> For behold, I create Jerusalem as a rejoicing and her people a joy. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people. The voice of weeping shall no longer be heard in her, nor the voice of crying. No more shall an infant from there live but a few days, nor an old man who has not fulfilled his days. For the child shall die 100 years old, but the sinner being 100 years old shall be accursed. In other words, the only thing they have to look forward to is lake of fire because they ain't repent and grow and overcome in that 100-year time span on that time period that God gave them. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For as the days of a tree, so shall be the days of my people. <clears throat> and my elect shall 
long enjoy the works of their hands. They shall not labor in vain, nor bring forth children for trouble. For they shall be the descendants of the blessed of the Lord, and their offspring with them. That's a time to look forward to. It shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are still speaking, I will hear. Abundant blessings, brother. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox. And dust shall be the serpent's food. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, says the Lord. So this scripture has been associated with the time period for the great white throne judgment, which is referenced in Revelation 20. But however, it has not been clear whether the 100 years denotes only the total time span of the great white throne judgment or a subset of the millennium. And, but it cannot be dogmatic due to the limited evidence available that this will be a total of 100 years. There are different alternatives for interpreting this verse while maintaining the teaching of three resurrections. The great, number one, the great white throne judgment will last for a hundred years. The church has taught that this will be a testing period of 100 years, during which billions of children and adults will have an opportunity to become converted and inherit eternal life. Therefore, the death of the sinner, being 100 years old, has been considered to be the second death God certainly could do things this way if he so chooses. <clears throat> Excuse me. Two, lifespans will exceed 100 years during the great white throne judgment. This verse certainly conveys a time of longevity, though not necessarily an exact 100 years. Isaiah 65, 20 says, No more shall an infant or a succulent from there live but a few days. For the child, which is Greek, which is Nar, young youth, young man, shall die 100 years old. This would describe pre flood type conditions where 100 years old would be considered a child, youth, or young man at a hundred years old. And to die at this age would be analogous, analogous, <laughs> excuse me, to a premature death. Sometimes I can't pronounce words, but some people's got it, some don't. <laughs> but anyway, Isaiah 65, 20 describes a time during the millennium. If so, then this would provide plenty of time for the pre-flood type extended lifespans. Under this scenario, brethren, one might expect the same type of lifespans during the great right throne judgment time period. Billions of people will be offered God's spirit for the first time, giving them eyes to see, ears to hear God's written word. Books were open. Uh, you can see a reference to that in Daniel 7, 10, and 9, 2. They will be judged according to how they then live by the things which were written in the books. <clears throat> God's written word, Hebrews 4, 12 through 13. And consequently, people in this resurrection will have their first opportunity to have their names written in the book of life which will be open for this purpose. But sadly, some will reject their one and only opportunity. So the summary characteristics of the second resurrection, number one, 
It does not take place until after the thousand years are over. Two, it is a resurrection of immortal life. Three, God will give those in the resurrection the opportunity to receive the Holy Spirit and receive eternal life. And four, though they will have a second mortal life, they will have their first opportunity for salvation. Now we're going to explore the third resurrection. And there has been many opinions and many different uh, teachings about this. Well, let me see if I can put it this way. Now, I'm sure some people are going to disagree with me, but if I'm wrong, then God will, will show it to me through his spirit. But I've studied this in depth. Uh, the first resurrection is comprised of the first fruit saints from the time of Adam and Eve to the return of Jesus Christ. The second resurrection is for those who were never drawn by the Father Therefore, they were never offered an opportunity to inherit eternal life. There's only one group of people left to be resurrected. Those who utterly rejected God's offer to inherit eternal life. Since it occurs after the second resurrection, it can properly be called the third resurrection. Turn your Bibles to Revelation 20, 13. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one according to his works. Revelation 20, 13 records the resurrection of a different group of people than those in the second resurrection, who will have already been resurrected and judged according to their works. Verse 12. The book of life is not open to those in verse 13. Neither will books, plural, be open again for them because they will have already totally rejected the instructions in these books. The books being the books of the Bible. The truth, God's word, Old and New Testament. Therefore, they will be judged according to their unrepentant works. The dead of verse 13 are described as emerging from the sea and from earthly graves. Of course, those in the second resurrection described in the previous verse will also be resurrected from wherever they died, land or sea. But verse 13 in Revelation 20 describes the beginning of the complete emptying of the land, sea, and death itself. Revelation 20, 14 through 15, then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, and anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Here, John describes two inanimate objects, death and Hades, as being cast into the lake of fire, signifying the termination of the grave, which is a holding place of inactivity. Ecclesiastes 9 and 10 is reference to that, as well as the destruction of death itself in 1 Corinthians 15, 26. You can write all those down if you want to. <clears throat> Scripture reveals all mankind must appear before Christ to give an account. This applies to the wicked as well. They must appear before Christ to receive their final sentence which is eternal death. That's a different kind of judgment. It's not Christians. Matthew 25, 31, 32, 46, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, 
<clears throat> excuse me, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All nations will be gathered before him. And he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. John 5, 21 through 29 says, For as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to whom he will. For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son, that all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He does not honor the Son, does not honor the Father. Who sent him? Most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. Most assuredly I say to you, the hour is coming, now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself and has given him authority to execute judgment, also because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. Daniel 12, 2. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Malachi 4, 1 through 2. For behold, the day is coming burning like an oven, and all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly, will be stubble. All, and the day which is coming shall burn them up, shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts. <clears throat> that will leave them neither root nor stubble or branch. But to you who fear, who stands in awe, who tremble at his word, who honor God, who love him, who loves his name, the Son of Righteousness shall rise with healing in his wings, and you shall go out and grow fat like stall-fed calves. You shall trample the wicked, for there shall be ashes. He's talking about when God creates a new earth, the earth is burned up. <clears throat> Excuse me. And they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day that I do this, says the Lord of hosts. Acts 24, 14 through 15. But this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, so I worship the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. I have hope in God, which they themselves also accept, that there will be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. Romans 14.10 For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.10 For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, and each one may receive the things done in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Did you do the works of God or not? Did you do what was required? Mentioned in 1 John 1, 2, and 3. Uh, did you do what Jesus talked about in John 14, 15, and 16? All those things. 2 Peter 3, 9 through 12. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long suffering toward us not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord would come as a thief in the night. 
That's to those who are not prepared, brethren. You know, like the seven virgins. Five were prepared and the five foolish ones. In which the heavens will pass away for the great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the earth that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, <clears throat> what manner of persons are you all to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. So as a review, brethren, the first resurrection is reserved for first fruit Christians who endure to the end. The second resurrection is for those yet to be offered an opportunity for eternal life. The only people who are not accounted for in the first and second resurrections are those who utterly rejected God's offer of salvation while they were alive. The third resurrection is reserved for these individuals. So what are some of its conditions? Well, Hebrews 6, 4 through 6 says, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away, to renew them again to repentance, seeing that they crucified themselves again for themselves, the Son of God, and put him to an open shame. And Hebrews 10, 26 through 27, For if we sin willfully, have we, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remains, that no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation, which would devour the adversaries. These verses, brethren, tell us that the sacrifice of Jesus Christ no longer remains for those who refuse to repent. Willful sinners. So in this context, willful sinning reflects an attitude that is beyond repentance. An attitude that doesn't want to repent. When a person's, when a person's attitude is beyond repentance, he commits the unpardonable sin because forgiveness requires repentance. The Bible refers to deliberate, willful rejection of the work of God as blasphemy against the Spirit. There will not be a second opportunity for the willfully unrepentant. The only thing that remains is a fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation in the lake of fire. The unpardonable sin results in a worse punishment than the death penalty of the Old Testament. Hebrews 2, 1 through 3 and 10, 28 through 29. What can be worse than this? The second death from which there is no resurrection. Eternal death. Those who reject God's spirit and insult the spirit of grace before Christ returns will not have a second opportunity to do so in the second resurrection. Peter discusses the results of blatantly rejecting God in 2 Peter 2.9. Peter says, The Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust under punishment of the day of judgment. Crisis. That's the Greek word. K-R-I-S-I-S. <coughs> Those described in 2 Peter 2.9 have already rejected God's spirit, denying the Lord who brought them, and bring on themselves swift destruction. Verse 1. Because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed, carousing in their own deceptions while they feast with you. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world, 
to the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. They are again entangled in them and overcome. It would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness. God has begun a process of judgment, brethren, leading to a final verdict for those he has now given the Holy Spirit. 1 Peter 4.17 states, For the time has come for judgment, or krima, K-R-I-M-A, to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those in the house of God who do not obey the gospel of God? One might think that krisis would have been used in 1 Peter 4.17, but krima, can also denote the process of judgment leading to a decision. Depending upon the context, both crisis and crema can denote a process and be virtually equivalent. We see in 1 Peter 4, 17, a warning about the potential verdict for those in God's church who do not obey the gospel. So the third resurrection leads into a different kind of judgment. It will not be a lengthy process of judgment covering the span of a lifetime. Second Peter uh, 3 and 7, But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, <clears throat> are reserved for fire until the day of judgment, crisis, and perdition of ungodly men. 2 Peter 3, 12-13 says, Looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Brethren, most of mankind has not yet entered a judgment leading to a final decision regarding eternal life or condemnation. Ultimately, God is going to make an eternal decision concerning every human being that has ever lived. And that's part of the elementary teachings, principles of Christ, listed in Hebrews 6, 1 through 2. And part of the elementary principles of Christ listed in Hebrews 6, 1-2 is eternal judgment or the Greek word krima, K-R-I-M-A. So the summary, characteristic of the third resurrection, one, it is a resurrection to death. The unrepentant and wicked are in this resurrection and they will be burned up. This is the second death. Everyone who has ever lived will experience the judgment process. Some will inherit eternal life in the first resurrection at his coming. Then after the thousand years are finished, most are unjust since the time of Adam and Eve will be in this second resurrection and receive their first opportunity to inherit eternal life. Lastly, those who reject God and therefore cannot be renewed again to repentance will be condemned in the third resurrection. This is a separate resurrection. The time involved will undoubtedly be very brief. It will be long enough only to carry out the death sentence for their evil life. Moreover, if this, if there is no third resurrection, then the incorrigibly wicked would have to be raised at the time, same time as those who never had a chance for salvation. Some people talk about the parable of the tares uh, mixed in with the wheat. They aren't in the first resurrection, so they would have to be in the second. If this is so, then there will be, then there, then where will they be, and what will they be doing during this period of time? It's a question to be asked. They would have to be restrained for this period of time until the earth and they with it are consumed by fire. 
This does not make sense. and There is nothing in the Bible to describe such a scenario. Consequently, there are three distinct groups of people, the converted, the blinded, and the wicked. And the sequence described in Revelation 20 is that of three separate resurrections. There is mention of a first resurrection, which implies at least one more resurrection. While there is no specific mention of a second or third resurrection, the sequence described certainly outlines three distinct resurrections, which involves the three distinct groups of people who have lived. So the summary of the three resurrections is as follows. One, the first resurrection is only for the dead in Christ. It is a resurrection to immortality. The wicked are not in this resurrection. Those who never had an opportunity for salvation are not mentioned in this resurrection. Two, there is another resurrection to immortal life. Therefore, it cannot be the first resurrection. Since God offers his Holy Spirit to them, they will have an opportunity to receive salvation. The wicked cannot be in this resurrection, as God will not be giving his Holy Spirit to them. And thirdly, the only time the wicked can come up in a resurrection is at a separate time. It cannot be in the first resurrection, nor can it be in the one where God offers salvation to those who never had an opportunity. This resurrection is for the purpose of final judgment on the wicked who will, who will be destroyed along with the earth. So brethren, I hope this explains in detail the three resurrections. So until next time, thank you and God bless for listening. Thank you.